you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for those of you, whoa, Sorry, no worries. As my dad would say, you want to help, then help. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm David. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I uh, have just grown up here. I've been here since I was five. Uh, a while ago, I was the middle school pastor, uh, and now I am getting to just be... I I've taught some classes around here, and I am Lisa's husband, who is one of the associate youth uh, directors. So that's my uh, real claim to fame. <laughs> I get to be Lisa's husband, so... Uh, Let's pray, and then we will dive into the scriptures. Lord, I uh, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for today. Thank you for bringing us here. Lord, I pray that as we open your word, you will do a work in and through us. Lord, I pray that uh, this isn't about me and my words, or it's not about me and any cleverness I can bring to your text, but rather that this is just a faithful representation of what you are calling us to. Let us be your people. And let us grow in obeying your commands. In the name of prayer. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'm really excited to get to share with you today. It is a blessing and a gift when I get to do that. When Ross asked me to preach for two weeks, I was really excited. I was like, hey, uh, I've been learning a lot this summer. I've been diving into a lot of different things and had a really good Bible study with some guys that really opened my eyes to some stuff. I was like, I've got some cool new things to talk about. And then as I spent time praying, uh, I, I also was remembering my time in Carpinteria and reading the Bible on vacation, what God was showing me in the waves. And I was like, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. And then the more I prayed, it was just, nope. <laughs> it was, go back to basics. Just go back to basics. It's not about being clever. It's not about new. It's about what's foundational. So we're going to examine the Great Command today, uh, and we're going to examine the Great Commission next week. We're just going to look at these absolute fundamentals as we are stripping away and we're asking ourselves who we want to be as we are peeling back all the other things and we're having bigger debates. It's sometimes good just to focus on what is essential, what is foundational, who are we and who are we actually called to be. So let's look at the Great Commandment. Let's see what love is. Uh, the Great Commandment is given to us uh, in each of what is known as the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, that just means, Synoptic just means that they're so closely tied together that they share a lot in common as they convey the story of Jesus. In each of these passages we've, that we're going to look at, we're going to see that the context for each one is a series of testing. Religious leaders are coming to test Jesus. Each of these come out of fighting and testing, of really challenging him. And one of the interesting things that we're going to see is that the answer Jesus gives is something everyone agrees on. In fact, in them, we're going to see in Matthew, Jesus gives the answer. In Mark, Jesus gives the answer and his opponent agrees with him and like says the same thing back. And in Luke, the opponent gives the answer, and Jesus says, you're right. <laughs> Everyone agrees on this. <laughs> it's very similar to like when we talk about like Christianity today, and we go, well, yeah, it's love God and love others. Everyone agrees on that. How do we live that out so differently? Jesus is going to give the most basic answer, but then call us to the most radical, transformed life because of it. So let's pray one more time before actually reading the scriptures, because... That's important. Lord, it's your word. It's your word. Open your word. Open our hearts to your word. Let us not be hard-hearted. Let me not be hard-hearted. Let me not think that I understand this just because I've studied it, just because I've heard it a million times. Even right now, in this moment, transform me by your word. And I pray the same blessing for each person in the sound of my voice. Transform us by your word. Your word is truth. In the name I pray. Amen. Amen. Matthew 24, uh, 22, 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they came together. 
And one of them, an expert in the law, asked a question in order to test him. Teacher, which command in the law is greatest? And he said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets depend on these two commands. So the first point to look at out of, out of this passage is that love is the command. <laughs> you could go through the whole Old Testament, and Jesus says here, you can sum it up in this right here. Love God, love others. <laughs> love the Lord your, your God with all that you are, and love your neighbor as yourself. You can sum it all up that way. The word here for love is, oh gosh, I'm always going to mispronounce this. I have literally practiced this word 60 times, and I still get it wrong. It's agapesis. No. Agapesis. <laughs> yeah. It's close like that. It's the, verb form of, uh, it's the verb form of agape. It becomes agapeo. And then it, this then changes the tense of that to a future command. Basically, you shall love. This is a demand. This is not a suggestion. This is not something to strive for. This is not for an elite class of Christian. And the rest of us, you know, just get by because we said a prayer. This is it. This is the foundational principle of being a Christian, of being in Christ, of being God's people. You shall love. Now, the question then is, well, what does that look like? What does that mean? Is it just I have to have affection for everyone? Do I need to just feel good toward everyone? No. (laughs) You are not going to like everyone. That's not the call. It doesn't say you shall like everyone. You shall like the Lord your God. You shall enjoy studying his word. You shall enjoy every worship song about the Lord your God. You shall delight in going to worship service. No. That's not what's going on here. I challenge you this week to prayerfully read through John 13 through 17 and then the book of 1 John. These books really, uh, these commit, sorry. These sections show us what Jesus is talking about, about what love looks like, what it means that this is the command. In the section in John, it's Jesus' last night with his disciples, his last Passover celebration with them. And it's the night that begins with humble service born out of love. Jesus loves his disciples. He loves his God. And so he steps up and he practically serves. Over and over in those chapters, he makes it clear that to love him is to obey him. And to obey him is to love each other that it is his command. And in 1 John, John takes that night and he expands it out. In five chapters, just the five chapters of 1 John, agapeo is used 17 times. The command, the action of love is repeated. It's not controversial, it's fundamental. So if this is the case, if this is the commands that Jesus is giving us, what does love mean? Is it just blindly accepting people as they are and just saying, you're good the way you are. I don't expect anything from you. I'll just take care of you. There's a quote uh, from a commentary. And usually I don't like to just like read quotes a lot and just read a ton of stuff, but it's just so much better than I can say it. So here we go. <laughs> Jesus is not simply advocating an emotional attachment or an abstract love. Rather, love here indicates a concrete responsibility, the act of being useful and beneficial to one's neighbors. To love is to give someone what they need. In the same way that individuals are called to care for themselves responsibly, to attune their lives, to carry out God's will, they we are to give ourselves to others to care for them responsibly and to help them attune their lives to carry out God's will. James sums it up even better because, you know, it's the word of God. (laughs) If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace 
Stay warm, be well fed. But you don't give them anything? What good is it? <laughs> to claim that we love each other and not care for each other is hypocritical lies. At best, it's self-deception because we think that an emotional or an intellectual assent is love. At worst, it's blatant hypocrisy. Love is practical. Love is Jesus feeding the 5,000, even though the crowds leave. <laughs> Jesus is healing all the people of their, of their diseases, even though very few of them follow him. Love is Jesus dying for the crowds as they mock him. Love is practical. He shows us this in the Sermon of the Mount. Love is an unconditional commitment to imperfect people in which one gives of oneself to another for the purpose of bringing people into the God's intended purpose. Love involves speaking truth. Jesus never pulled a punch. <laughs> but it's also accepting people in their imperfect state. It's Jesus seeing Zacchaeus on the road and saying, I'm coming into your house. That love and acceptance bringing change. Love is powerful. And it is a command. I don't get a choice. The Christian faith is simple, but impossibly hard. Let's look at this passage now. Let's look at how Mark changes this in this, uh, not changes, this, let's see how Mark recounts this debate now. In Mark 12, 28 through 34, one of the scribes approached, and when he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which command is the most important of all? So Jesus answered, the most important one is this, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is love the, your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you're right, teacher. You have correctly said that he is one, that there is no one else except him, and to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings or sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to ask him questions any longer. One of the important things that we see from this is that love is holistic, Love is not just a feeling like we talked about. It's not just your heart. It's not just your emotions. This is based off of, like Jesus' answer here is based off of the prayer that devout Jews prayed every day. Still today, <laughs> for thousands of years. This is based off the Shema. It comes out of Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then it combines Leviticus 19, 18, and love your neighbor as yourself. He brings these two together and says, here it is. You don't get to just claim, I love God with all I am. It's me and Jesus are good, but me and Janessa, mm, not so much. You don't get to pull that card. You just don't. You don't get to say that, you know, Emotionally, I'm really good with God, but mentally, I, I don't know. Like, reading that Bible, like, it's, it's too hard, whatever. I'm just going to, like, do good stuff, whatever. You don't get to do that. You don't get to pick and choose who you love, and you don't get to pick and choose what parts of God you love him with. When he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, this isn't supposed to be that we divide these things into quarters, and we go, okay, how am I doing in each of these components of my personhood and I'm loving God? Am I sort of loving God? Not? It's a figure of speech. It's poetry. It's literally supposed to just get you to say, all of you, there's not a realm that you don't get to love God in. There isn't a part of this that goes, well, you know, he didn't say my career, so I can go make money and do my own thing. When I, whatever I do at work is one thing, but what I do outside of that is another thing. No. 
Your whole life is utterly devoted to God. And because it becomes utterly devoted to God, all of you then also gets devoted to your neighbor. You don't get to pick and choose. I don't get to pick and choose. And it sucks. It absolutely sucks. Because I want to love God with my mind and leave my emotions at the door 90 times out of 10. I want to have the right answers, and I want to read the right books, and I want to be able to debate you and make sure that I show how smart I am. But that's not loving God. That's loving knowledge. That's loving the Bible. That's not loving God. Or I just want, you know, I just want everyone to feel welcomed and accepted and cared for. I just want everyone just to always be okay. I just want there to be peace. I don't want us to deal with conflict. I don't want us to fight. I just want things to be nice. That's not loving God or loving others. That's loving not having to deal with conflict. <laughs> Again, all of these passages are conflict passages, guys. <laughs> God is, Jesus is literally showing us that love is the solution to our conflicts. Doing the right thing by somebody sometimes is calling them out on their crap. Now, there's a right way and a wrong way to do that. Again, you could be loving being right <laughs> and not loving the person. But our love has to be holistic. It has to be. We have to love everyone, and we have to love God with all we are. We don't get to pick and choose. And if we think we get to pick and choose, we see that we don't in the next passage, <laughs> in Luke 10, 25 through 37. So then the, an expert in the law came and stood up and tested him and said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, What is written in the law? How do you read it? The expert answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. See? A known answer. <laughs> Everyone agrees on this part. And Jesus says, you're right. Do this and you'll live. <laughs> but wanting to justify himself. Wanting to feel like, this, I'm going to comment here, sorry. Wanting to feel like he's already doing it. Wanting to prove he's got the right answer. Wanting to make sure that he doesn't have to do what he doesn't want to do. He says, and who is my neighbor? So Jesus took up the question. I love that phrase because so often Jesus doesn't take up the question. When you read the Gospels, people ask Jesus questions and he answers them a whole different thing. <laughs> he, Jesus would give most of our politicians a run for his money in how they answer questions. They, they don't answer the question that's asked. They answer the question they wish was asked. Jesus does the same thing. <laughs> but this one he takes up. This is exactly the question he wants to because this is the question that penetrates our heart when we think we're doing the great commandment. This was something that was like, this was one thing that came out of my study that was crazy to me. I don't know why I never made this connection, but we're going to read a pretty well-known parable. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. We literally have Good Samaritan laws on file sometimes. It's so, like, commonplace in society. But Jesus ties this to the great commandment. <laughs> I never put that context together because I don't know why. So Jesus answered, and who is my name? Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him. When he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him, bandaged his wounds, poured olive oil and wine. When he put him on his own animal, he then brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? 
the one who showed mercy to him, said, he said. Then Jesus said, go and do the same. Love is universal. You don't get to have an enemy. You don't get to have an enemy. You have an enemy, but your enemy is not flesh and blood. There is no human you get to count as your adversary and your enemy, even if they count you as theirs. Those who truly love God will also truly love those who are made in his image period, in a discussion. If you are reading the Bible in such a way that you can justify passing on the other side of the road because you have a more important religious obligation, like the priest or the Levite, you're misinterpreting the Bible. Because Jesus has told us the Bible is about him, and he has told us that all the law and the prophets hangs on love God and love others. It's very much when he's having other conflicts with the Pharisees and they're attacking him. And he goes, how is it that you misrepresent the law so that you can claim that because you've devoted something to God, you don't have to take care of your mom and dad? You've misinterpreted it. You've made your religious commitments break the law of God. The scriptures come down to love God and love others. This is the command. Any other commands have to support that command. If they don't, we're misinterpreting it. Or Jesus is wrong. And I would rather say I'm misinterpreting the Bible than say Jesus was wrong. <laughs> Personally, I get the Bible wrong a lot. <laughs> I have read the Bible. I have taught the Bible for years now. I have taught the Bible for... 22 years now, because I started in high school. I have gotten it wrong, <laughs> if not more <laughs> than right, at least as much. <laughs> but praise be to God, he, he reveals himself, and he is faithful, and he is generous, and he is good. And we can change. One of the biggest annoyances I have right now with current political debate is like when people change, we call them flip-floppers. And we like look at that as bad as opposed to, I learned more and I changed my opinion. <laughs> if people don't change over time, there's a problem. If we are not being transformed from one level of glory to another, we're not walking with Jesus. If we're not learning and thus changing and thus growing, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> That's a sad life to be in. Being stuck at a position that you were in 20 years ago and being stuck with that forever, that's sad. That's sad. We need to grow. We need to change. We need to become more like Jesus. I need to become more like Jesus today. What this love looks like comes out of Luke. It's, I say to you who listen, love your enemies. Do what is good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone hits you on the cheek, offer them the other one. If anyone takes away your cloak, don't hold back your shirt either. Give to anyone who asks of you. From someone who wants to take your things, don't ask for them back. Just as you want others to do for you, do the same for him. If you love those who love you, what good is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Our society today is so focused on loving and accepting, but loving and accepting those who agree with us. The tribalism is huge. It's are you in or are you out? If you are in, you will be the most loved, the most accepted, the most cared for. We are a community and we care for it. I have been a part of some communities that are just beautiful to be around but you could easily be on the outside if you don't think or act or look the right way. And that happens so much even in the Church of Christ. What should be different about us is that there is no one outside the realm of our love. 
We love even those who hate us. We see no one as our enemy, no one as our adversary. We see them as, if you are not in Christ, then you are in chains and in bondage to the powers of darkness. And we hate those powers and we're coming after you. We're coming after you with love to set you free. Just like Jesus looked at a world that was in bondage and chains and came after us. If you are in Christ, you are going to be his ambassador. Love your enemies, do what is good, and lend, expect nothing in return. Then your reward will be great. You'll be children of the Most High, for he is gracious to the unfaithful and evil. So you be merciful just as he is merciful. There's no one who doesn't deserve your mercy. There is no one who doesn't deserve your love. Everyone doesn't deserve your mercy. Everyone doesn't deserve your love. Because you know what? You don't deserve love or mercy. I don't deserve love or mercy. But God gave it to us anyway. And if he did, he calls us to do likewise. You are called to be like Jesus. John puts it this way, just between the eyes. If anyone says, I love God and yet hates his brother or sister, he's a liar. Love doesn't pull punches, guys. <laughs> John loves us very much. The whole book of 1 John is him saying, I love you guys so much. If you claim to love God and hate other people, you're a liar. Ow. <laughs> the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he's seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And we have this command from him, the one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. This command I give you, love one another. Because love is transformative. It is the only thing that actually can change us. The transformative power of love is the heart of the gospel. The story of the scriptures is the good and loving and caring God who out of the abundance of his generosity creates a world. And he creates image bearers. He creates men and women to reflect his glory and to experience his love and his goodness and in turn to do that love and goodness in this world. And we choose not to. We choose to seek our own way and our own good rather than reflect his love and good. And he didn't give up on us. He should have. We can't transform ourselves, but he knew that he could transform us by his love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God knew the only way to transform the world, the only way to transform us is through his love. Love is that force. It is the force. It's Kevin White walking with a really annoying 16-year-old David who thinks he knows everything and spending hours at the beach when he could have been doing more fun stuff, breaking him down and showing him he doesn't know everything. It's Sam carrying Frodo to Mount Doom when he can't do it for himself. It's Luke offering himself up in order to save Vader. Thanks, MP. It's Jesus' arrest, trial, torture, and crucifixion. It's Jesus hanging on the cross, looking down at a crowd, calling for his blood, mocking him and saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's looking at anyone when you're heart gets full of anger and judgmentalness and going and looking at that person and going father forgive them they don't know what they're doing father forgive me i don't know what i'm doing father forgive us transform us i've had a hard time with this truth the last few years And it, got, it hit me between the eyes in the war, when the war in Ukraine really broke out. And I just was demonizing Putin. <laughs> I really was. I just looked at him like a little devil with horns. <laughs> and it was just like, my prayers were, God, just strike this man down dead. <laughs> and then I was reading my Bible. 
I hated a person and thought I was doing good with Jesus. And sure enough, I was in 1 John. <laughs> and God called me a liar. <laughs> and I had to spend time praying for his good. <laughs> it still doesn't make sense to me. It really doesn't. But either I trust that people can change, or I don't. And if I don't believe that anybody can change, what am I doing here? I'm wasting my life by coming to church and talking to you. I really am. If people can't change, if Jesus can't change lives, what are we doing here? Eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die. <laughs> Either Jesus changes people, or he doesn't. Either Jesus changes me, or he doesn't. The love of God compels us, and it demands of us more than we want to give. The holistic, transformative, universal command of God demands far more of us than we want to give. I, very much like the teacher of the law, want to set limits on what I have to do. Who's my neighbor? Can I just love my immediate family? That's hard enough. <laughs> Can, can I just love my extended family? That's even harder. I don't think I can do that one. Can it just be the church? I love you guys. That's harder. <laughs> the more people you add on to this, the harder it gets. And I don't get to put a limit. Because Jesus didn't put a limit. The Samaritan wasn't walking down the road and just going, who am I going to love today? Instead, he was walking down the road, and there was someone who needed him today, and that's who he had to love. It's who, it's, if you are honestly being led by the Spirit, being transformed by the Spirit, being guided by the Spirit, if we are walking in the Spirit, then it's when God puts someone who needs your help in front of you, that's who you love that day, whether they're on the inside or the outside. There's no one outside God's love. There are times where God will set up the boundaries and say, I have reached out to this person. God has, set, has made his offer known, and they have rejected it. True enough. We get what we get. But do you know when the, the moment is that that rejection is set, is set in stone? I don't. I rejected God many times before, I, before he broke down my walls and brought me into his kingdom. I came to this church a lot. <laughs> and I faked and lied a lot about being a Christian for a long time. I rejected the love of God a lot before he broke me and he brought me into his kingdom. If, I, if people had given up on me because, well, he's rejected Jesus, I'm done with him. I wouldn't be here. You don't know until they're dead <laughs> whether or not the act of love that you show is the one that's going to show them Jesus. So show them love. You are the ambassadors of Christ. God is making his appeal through you. Be reconciled to God. And if you today are not one of those ambassadors, you're on the fence, if you have not experienced the love of God, so you're not all this command to share that love, let me beg of you. Let me beg of you and tell you, Jesus wants to love you. He has loved you, he wants to love you, and he will love you. I'm just going to leave you with one final quote. The love of God is practical, powerful, and personal. An old, old Roman emperor, Julian the Apostate, named that by Christian leaders because he tried to turn the empire pagan again after it had been Christian for a long time, was writing to the pagan priests and was super angry about these Galileans 
And he, and he writes, when it came about that the poor were neglected and overlooked by us and you, the priests, then I think the impious Galileans observed the fact and devoted themselves to philanthropy. They support not only their own poor, but ours as well. And the whole world is going after them. It was their practical, sacrificial love that even when the powers that be tried to turn against Christianity, couldn't stop it. Julian couldn't turn back the tide. He died a very frustrated and broken man. You can read it. <laughs> like, he was a very angry and frustrated man that he couldn't turn the empire back because the impious Galileans were just too loving. You can have all the right answers. You can have all the right plans and strategies. But if you have love, you're nothing. Pray with me. Lord God, help us to actually love our neighbor as ourselves. Help us to look at this city that you have planted us in and ask ourselves not how we can get more people to come in these doors, but how we can better leave them and love the people around us. Lord, I love to hide in my house. It's very hard to love people hiding in my house. Help me, Lord God, when I am out to keep my eyes open on how I can love. And as I love your image bearers, help me then to see you more and to love you with all that I am. And as I love you more, as I dig into your word, as I sing your praises, as I do what you have called me to do, as I pray and I try to draw near to you, fill my heart with so much love that it can't help but love other people. If I love you, my heart will become like your heart. And your heart is that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. So make that my heart. Make that our heart. In your name I pray. Amen. Uh, please stand for the benediction. And as you do, I will remind those of you who uh, have kids that if you uh, talk to Lisa about the parent meeting that's been postponed, that would be great, <laughs> so that she can know when would be good for you guys to do that. I'll also say, those of you who are new, we would love to get to know you. There's a welcome table in the back, and we would love to give you a gift. Um, just say, thanks for showing up. And a practical aspect of love. <laughs> And uh, finally, if you don't know me and you would like to like, meet and say hi, I would love to get to know you and say hi. So, by all means. Yes. And then there is the meeting at 11. We are, if you are a member especially, we would love for you to stay so you can get your questions answered so we can vote next week. If you are a member, please be here next week at 11 for the vote. And if you are not a member and you just want to be a part of the church family business, by all means, you are still welcome to stay too. But... By all means, you don't have to. Here is the benediction. It's from Ephesians 3. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width the height and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses all knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask and think according to the power that he works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen? Amen. 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 Go in peace. But stay around. <laughs>